Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to join you here in Budapest. Hopefully I'll have some useful uh, and uplifting anecdotes for you today. Uh, what I want to talk about really is now that we are running the world with computation, why is it that we find it so difficult to actually govern that world? Um, what we call planetary scale computation, both distorts and deforms our traditional political geographies and produces new territories in its own image. Computation today is perhaps less a type of technology than something, than rather something like a, a universal solvent that turns, uh, that makes all matter potentially algorithmically intelligent from both from an ecological to an interpersonal scale. So instead of seeing um, these, these scales of planetary computation, from, you say, smart grids, cloud computing, uh, smart cities, internet of things, uh, augmented reality robotics, as a bunch of different species or genres of computing all spinning out on their own, I argue that we should in instead see them as forming into a coherent whole, uh, not unlike a software hardware stack, um, an accidental megastructure, if you like. Um, in the book, The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, which comes out this fall from MIT Press, I argue that this configuration is, uh, should be understood as a totality, uh, and uh, that totality is our primary design challenge. Uh, and among those challenges is how it reorganizes our political and economic authorities in its own image. So, the stack is a platform, but not all platforms are stacks. Um, and for platform, design and politics and economics means something rather different than it we're used to. So today I want to talk about then the platform, that we, not the platform that we have, but the ones that we're designing, um, whether we realize it or not, uh, and talk a little bit about the spectrums of scenarios that may ensue. Now, when we talk about computation as a force and function of planetary scale intrigue and anomalies, events and pseudo-events are plentiful. And it's hard to know um, what signals a genuinely new situation and what is trivial. Uh, the Google Earth standoff between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, Estonian e-citizenship, Bitcoin, da data.gov, hyperbolic packet routing technologies, .p2p, open DNS, net neutrality in the Golden Shield, NSA versus Unit 6139, NSA versus Anonymous, Anonymous versus the Syrian Electronic Army, NSA versus Syrian Electronic Army versus ISIL versus SFB versus North Korea versus Samsung versus Apple versus the European Parliament and so on. So which of these situations actually scales into a general lesson uh, and which actually obscures the critical junctures? Uh, what will the long-term ramifications of the privatization of the common intellect by search and social network platforms, for example, have on our ability to self-govern or or rather towards what forms of government, governance are they already serving us up. The larger geographical drama um, of all this is seen perhaps most explicitly in the Sino-Google conflicts of 2008 to the present. China hacking Google, Google pulling out of China, the NSA hacking China, NSA hacking Google, Google ghostwriting books for the State Department, and Google wordlessly circumventing the last instances of state authority, not by transgressing them, but by absorbing them into its service model. Meanwhile, Chinese router firmware bides its time. This is, I think, should be seen as a fundamental conflict over the geometry of political geography itself. With one side bound by the territorial integrity of the state, and the other by the gossamer threads of the world's information demanding to be made organized and made useful, as Google's motto goes. This is a clash between two logics of governance, two geometries of territory. One, a subdivision of the horizontal, the other, a stacking of vertical layers. One, a state, the other, a para-state. One superimposed on top of the other at any point on the map and never resolving into some consensual cosmopolitanism, but rather continuing to grind against the grain of one another's planes. This characterizes, I think, the geopolitics of our moment. This plus the gravity of generalized secession, but 
the two are interrelated. So from here, we see that contemporary cloud platforms are displacing, if not also replacing, traditional core functions of states and demonstrating for both good and ill new spatial and temporal models of politics and publics. Archaic states drew their authority from the regular provision of food. And over the course of modernization, more was added to the intricate bargains of Leviathan. Energy, infrastructure, legal identity and standing, objective and comprehensive maps, credible currencies, flag brand loyalties. And bit by bit, each of these and more are now also provided by cloud platforms. Not necessarily as formal replacements for state versions, but like Google ID, simply more useful and effective for daily life. So for these platforms, the terms of participation are not mandatory, and because of this, the social contracts are more extractive than constitutional. The cloud polis draws on the cognitive capital of its users who trade attention and microeconomic compliance in exchange for global infrastructural services. And in turn, it provides each of them an active and discrete online identity and access to those in that infrastructure. So that said, it's far from clear that we have anything like a proper geopolitical theory of platforms. Before the full ambition of the US uh, security apparatus was so evident, it was thought by many that the cloud, for example, was a place where states had no ultimate competence, nor maybe even a role to play. They were too slow, too dumb, too easily outwitted by using the right browser. States would be cored out, it was said, component by component, until nothing was left but a well-armed insurance scheme with its own World Cup team. And in the long run, that may still be the outcome, with modern liberal states taking their place next to ceremonial monarchies and stripped of all but symbolic authority, not necessarily replaced, but displaced and misplaced to one side. But now we're hearing the opposite and equally brittle conclusion. That is, the cloud is only the state, that it equals the state, that its totality is necessarily totalitarian. And despite all, I wouldn't take that bet either. We observe historically that new forms of governance arise through the capacities to tax flows at ports, at gates, on property, on income, on attention, on clicks, on movement, on electrons, on carbon, so forth. And it's not at all clear whether in the long run cloud platforms will overwhelm state control of such flows or whether states will continue to evolve into cloud platforms, absorbing those displaced functions back into themselves. So, between the state, the market, and the platform, which is better designed to tax the interfaces of everyday life and to draw sovereignty thereby? So, again, it's not that the cloud replaces the state. It's just as, much, just as much as the cloud absorbs modern state functions, the state itself rotates into a cloud platform. That is, states see in certain ways, but seeing like a state evolves in relation to what they can see. And with the cloud, they can see more and different things. It's critical also to underscore then that cloud platforms, including also sometimes state apparatuses, are exactly that, platforms. It's important as well to recognize that platforms are not only a technical infrastructure, they are an institutional form as well. They centralize like states, scaffolding the terms of participation to rigid but universal protocols just as they decentralize like markets, coordinating economies, not through the super imposition of fixed plans, but through coordinated emergence. So next to states and markets, platforms are a third form, coordinating through fixed protocols and scattering free range users in loving, if also disconcertingly omniscient grace. This platform is totality, drawing the interfaces of everyday life into itself and in this, we see that the maximal state and the minimal state start to look weirdly similar. And as far as I concern, the geopolitical question of the moment is to develop a proper theory of platforms. It's their topology, their program. Our own subjective enrollment in this, each of us, is then less as citizens, states have citizens, or as consumers, markets have homo economicus, platforms have users. So what do we mean then, platforms, really? 
Well, first of all, platforms, by this we don't just mean IT platforms. The urban street grid is the canonical platform. Centrally planned, standard protocols, rigorously open to idiosyncratic, supporting un idiosyncratic uses, supporting unplannable and egalitarian uses and effects. We also need to protect the concept of platform from those who would conflate it with unregulated markets on both the right and the left, unfortunately. So recall that a recent um, claim by Uber, Uber to dismiss a lawsuit filed by blind people arguing that the company cannot be sued for providing equal, uh, to, requiring to provide Google public accommodation in the US because it only exists in cyberspace. This is a misidentification. It's not even, doesn't even properly describe what Uber is, let alone what platforms are and what platforms do. Platforms work not according to a premeditated master plan. They set the stage for actions to unfold. An ideal platform is like an empty diagram through which users <clears throat> mediate new and archived information. For example, a search engine does not produce internet content for its users, it structures the value of content that the users produce. Platforms are based on a rigorous standardization of the scale and duration and morphology of their essential components. And it's the simplicity and rigidity of those platforms that makes them predictable for users, allowing them to do things that platform designers could never possibly predict. And so the design of platforms is characterized by this apparent paradox of an invariable, the imposition of an invariable mechanism, an autocracy of means, also providing for an emergent heterogeneity of self-directed uses, a liberty of ends. Platforms centralize some aspects and decentralize others in weird ratios. And so the political conversation preoccupied by the metaphysics of state centralization versus market decentralization makes no sense here. The economics of platforms, uh, platforms mediation of user input uh, of information might result in the value of that information, for, an increase in the value of that information for the user. Platform network effects absorb and train that information, making it more visible, more structured, more extensible for the individual user in relation to all the other users who further make use of it and thereby increase its social value for both of them. At the same time, it's likely that the platform itself, um, it's the platform itself that derives the greater value, uh, the greater net profit uh, from these circulations in total. Each time a user interacts with the platform's governing algorithms, it also trains those decision models, however incrementally, to better evaluate subsequent transactions. So an economically sustainable platform is one for which the costs of providing services are in the aggregate less than the value for the platform of what the users have input. So platform economics then provides two surpluses, a user surplus in which the information is made more valuable for the user once involved in the platform, usually at little or no direct transactional cost. And second, a platform surplus, that is the differential value um, of the user information is greater for the platform than the cost of providing that platform to the user. So let me provide two examples, um, each one in which that ratio between one kind of platform value and the other is sort of skewed in the extreme. The ground zero of robotic labor automation may be in California, but a few hundred miles south of Silicon Valley in the San Joaquin Valley, where 1% of the US farmland produces 8% of its agricultural output, making California the fifth largest supplier of food in the world. The region's capital is the crestfallen metropolis of Fresno. Roughly a third of all jobs in the city are tied directly to agriculture, which makes the economy particularly vulnerable to downward wage pressures, as well as to climate change related drought. The pressures of increased efficiencies of crop losses towards crop diversity, speed of delivery, all make agriculture an important area for applied robotic automation, picking, sorting, transporting, as well as plant-by-plant -plant drone observation and diagnosis. These factors together nominate Fresno to enjoy first mover disadvantage in the evolution of similar urban centers towards a broadband dependent manoralism and serfdom and evacuation and its economy toward a kind of cloud feudalism. 
Detroit is the first case study we have as to what automation can do to an insufficiently diversified urban system that is dependent upon intensive assembly labor, but Fresno may soon take its place next to it, where future scenarios for cloud feudal life are mostly grim. Most remaining jobs might be related to servicing the automated logistics and warehousing of food packets, not so dissimilar to working in, in an Amazon warehouse or FedEx routing facility. Meanwhile, the surplus population that has not or cannot exit fends for itself. So cloud feudalism can be defined as a particular distribution of power between central and commanding platform servers and quasi-autonomous, if relatively powerless, network clients as applied to human economic geography. Others have articulated the problems associated with these kinds of arrangements, their deflationary impact on demand-side growth, their ultimate macroeconomic instability, not to mention social inequity. Under such re regimes, platform economics works to monopolize power and wealth into centripetal consolidations of extracted value, such that the ratio of value realized by those users who collaborate with the platform commons, the user platform value, to those whose claims on infrastructural profits, platform surplus value, is grotesquely misaligned asymmetrical in the extreme in favor of the latter, not the former. Now, of course, nobody is legally forced to work on this given platform, but if everyone in principle has the right of exit and to opt out of their end user agreement for another platform offered elsewhere, but all the good spots have already been taken by high-end cloud policies with exclusionary criteria for entry, keeping the plurality of humans at bay, then the difference between state violence on the border and the posted entry fee of the gated community between positive and negative freedom, essentially, is dark and bitter comedy. So if cloud feudalism represents the negative end of the spectrum, then the positive end of the spectrum, not even necessarily the same spectrum, be, might be one in which the platform value ratio is reversed. That is one in which the value for the society of users from the platform is asymmetrically greater than the value the platform gets from them. Well, what could that look like? Well, it's hard to pick up a business magazine or read a political blog these days without some reference to the idea that, that it's some imminent combination of automation and 3D printing and Internet of Things and artificial intelligence is, just about, to, is about to lead to a massive structural unemployment, not only in manufacturing, but in cognitive labor as well, now made redundant. Depending on which study is, is quoted, as many as 40 to 60% of all jobs in the US or the UK are potentially affected by software or hardware-based automation, which begs the question, what does a society with 40 to 60% unemployment look like? From Plato to the situationist, utopia has been described as a society in which work is done by machines, not people, who now spend their time as something to play with and savor, not to sell for food. But our real world examples of societies with 40 to with 50% unemployment are anything but ideal societies. So other things must come into play to decide whether this kind of global scale automation platform is after Buckminster Fuller, utopia or oblivion. One way automation an automation platform could possibly both unemploy a lot of people and not cause social disaster is with a universal basic income. And recently, both left and right economists have taken the UBI as a possible way to prevent demand-side crash and to ensure that the spoils of automation, its platform value, are distributed to the widest user base possible. But if, if some countries adopt this and others don't, then the global divide between the haves and the have-nots decided by the accident of birth geography is amplified, not dampened. Also, if automation, if automation platforms at a society-wide scale also bring the kinds of ubiquitous deflationary pressures that are expected, automated goods and services, down to zero marginal cost, then money, quote-unquote, digital or otherwise, may not be the only thing necessary. For example, what Google Docs provides for now for free would have cost a corporation tens of millions of dollars just a few years ago. So food, housing, healthcare will still cost money, but why try to pay for things that are arcing towards free with a basic income of money? So in addition to UBI, we also need something like USL, a universal service level. Certain things that are necessary to enjoy a life freely chosen 
must be universally available so that they can no longer act as a constraint on those choices. Some of these could, would need to be paid for with money, but provided as part of a general platform economy and social contract, perhaps with states and with markets in different ways. One name for this scenario is fully automated luxury communism. But obviously that has strange connotations and references to very different kinds of state-based systems, so we need another name. And the fact that it's so much easier to name the dystopian version than the utopian version, the cloud feudalism being the utopian, the, that is, is rather telling. So how could that run? Well, in the 60s and 70s, socialist cybernet cyberneticians tried to solve what Friedrich Hayek calls the socialist pricing problem by using information computing networks and using what then, back, back then was supercomputing capacity, but today is roughly enough processing power to run a good alarm clock. What is the socialist pricing problem? Markets send and receive pricing signals. They are information processing machines, so what Hayek called catalaxy. But today we have lots of examples where platforms served by more robust computing systems re realize a kind of synthetic catalaxy. Price signaling in real time is no problem for the planned economies of Walmart supply chains, Amazon's, Amazon's long tail uh, pricing algorithms or, or, or Google's user attention auctions. Not only could such platforms or better future versions of them be used to solve the socialist pricing problem, perhaps they could also solve the capitalist pricing problem too. The capitalist pricing problem comes from how markets exclude so-called externalities in individual transaction price signals. The ultimate ecological or public health cost of that gallon of gasoline is not reflected in its price. And so its price is just as distorted as that of the old school planned economy. And undistorting it is essential. So this positive variation on algorithmic governance might be one in which various deep universal addressing systems IPv6 offers roughly 10 to the 23 addresses per person. Blockchain has, uh, bit, uh, blockchains are two to the 200, have two, two to the 256 possible public keys. Might allow us to somehow identify and trace and track all the particular effects and ramifications of a particular transaction. All along the sourcing and supply chain, the use chain, disposal chain, to adjudicate and enforce its actual cost and as reflected, to be reflected in its transactional price. Because there are no real externalities, because there is no real outside to put them. Deep incentives to make negative externalities like carbon more scarce must be built into the centralizing command infrastructure of the economy itself, ideally at the level of its information processing, its price. Now, temporary autonomous zones are cute and fun, but to paraphrase Nick Chernesek, Goldman Sachs is not worried about open source urban gardens or artisanal light bulbs. Deep addressability, however, and more pervasive and accountable supercomputing could contrib can contribute to a synthetic catalaxy that could realize a shift in structure in the platform itself, not just in its visible cultural effects. So, Tim O'Reilly's riff that the real killer app of, of Internet of Things is insurance may be more, a more provocative notion than he realizes if taken to mean primarily the precise long-term risk models of enterprise reinsurance that underwrite or better refuse to underwrite any large-scale capital project like extracting carbon deposits from under the ground. So algorithmic governance should be able to enforce rules but also to learn, learn them. Blockchain advocates uh, evangelize its decentralized architecture, which is very likely a key means towards that accountability. But its maturation into a commanding architecture also means centralization. It means getting over the fact that platforms both are both centralizing and decentralizing at the same time. So again, I'm not arguing pro or anti-platforms as either a good or an evil, but nor am I arguing that they're neutral. They aren't, and it's their lack of neutrality that makes them useful as geopolitical design tools. The critique of infrastructure is essential, but it must also rotate into infrastructural scale design models if it's serious and not just posturing. 
And for this, it's useful to think in terms of totalities, such as the stack, because they provide a way to see the interrelationships of distributed agency, subjectivity, cause and effect, all at once. But while looking askance at our idiot predicaments of today, we can well wonder if our current faculties of analysis and making our hideous languages are actually capable of authoring any lasting alternatives. Perhaps ours is not a world of information, but a wall of noise. As some would optimistically prototype the secular alter cosmopolitans to come, others lay the groundwork for cloud-based neo-feudalism, Visigoths with iPads, barbarian theological microstates with thriving biotech and nanotech industries, like California, perhaps. Supercomputing does not inoculate us from feudalism, from superstition, but it can perhaps provide for, the, for their opposite. That is, a futurity and a futurism without guarantees, only plasticity. And so, the accidents keep piling up, the jurisdictions are more interwoven, the geometry of political geography is only more complex, especially in that it seems to have no outside no free space to delimit itself against. Our accidental megastructure is more plural, more contradictory, more composite, more polyscalar. But if so, um, and if Paul Virilio's axiom that the invention of any new technology is also simultaneously the invention of a new kind of accident is true, then the opposite holds true as well. The accident also produces a new technology. Thank you.